Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Your time has expired. We'll now move to question time, and I'm going to Senator Fawcett. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Was the Assistant Treasurer reflecting government policy on interest rates this morning when he said, and I quote, we think that what's already in the system should do the job to ensure that we can dampen down demand, end quote? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I just missed the end of the question, but I, th I think I've got it. Um, yeah, actually, if you wouldn't mind. Sorry, you, I just Senator missed the end Fawcett, of it. If you wouldn't mind repeating. So, thank you, Senator Rees. I'll do that. Was the Assistant Treasurer reflecting government policy on interest rates this morning when he said that, and I quote, we think what's already in the system should do the job? To ensure that we can dampen down demand. End quote. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, um, President. I haven't actually seen the transcript of, of that interview, but I, I do understand that the Assistant Treasurer. Well, the, I do understand that the Assistant Treasurer um, was outlining uh, that our, about our government's plan to deliver on cost of living relief. He also indicated that the RBA has a tough job to do, and that the RBA is independent. Um, and those statements are correct. The RBA does have a, a difficult job to do. It is independent of government. It makes decisions based on the information that it has available to it at the time. The government's position reflects that. It's an independent body making decisions on monetary policy in this country. The area where the government has the area where the government has something. Uh, to do is on making sure that our, our decision making, the decisions we make in relation to the budget and others, do not make the job of the Reserve Banks uh, harder. And that is the government's position. Thank you, Minister. Senator Fawcett, first supplementary. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, President, despite the um, minister saying that what they have in place would dampen down demand, the RBA said in its statement yesterday, and I quote, the board expects that further increases in interest rates will be needed over the months ahead to ensure that inflation returns to the target and that this period of high inflation is only temporary." End quote. The assistant treasurer said this morning, quote, I'm hoping if this is not the last, talking about interest rate rises, it's near the last of the rate rises. End quote. Minister, why does the Albanese government contradict the RBA? Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Minister Gallagher. Well, the government isn't contradicting um, the RBA, and I've read, I've, I've read um, the governor's uh, statement on the mon monetary policy decision, uh, and it's very clear that the Reserve Bank is making decisions about how to get deal with the inflation challenge and how to return inflation to uh, more normal levels. Um, it's a challenge not only for the Reserve Bank but for the government as well. Um, and of course, the bank needs to make these de decisions independent of any influence. That we have total and utter trust in them making the decisions uh, that they need to do to ensure that inflation doesn't remain higher for longer. And they are saying that they are seeing inflation moderating. The challenge for the government in working with the Reserve Bank and not against it is to make sure that the decisions we take uh, are supportive uh, and working alongside monetary policy and not against it, which is why the decisions we're taking in the budget are informed by that. Thank you, Minister. Dealing Your time has expired. Senator Fawcett, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, with the increase in the cash rate to 3.35 per cent, the eighth successive rise under your government, it will add more than $10,000 in extra repayments for the average Australian family with a variable rate mortgage. She couldn't answer that yesterday. With no plan to tackle inflation, a treasurer distracted by writing essays, and an assistant treasurer who contradicts the central bank, isn't it the case that Australians will keep paying more under your government? Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Conveniently, in that question, left off the fact that there was an interest rate increase uh, during the month of May when you were uh, in, in government, uh, and that the highest rate of inflation quarter, the highest quarter of inflation growth, was in the March quarter 
last year who was in government uh, then? and who was in, in government was then. This is an inflation oh, challenge that we inherited. We inherited this challenge. Order. The government has a plan to deal with it. Order. It's to deal with uh, cost of living relief, where we don't add to inflation. It's to deal with some of the supply chain problems that we've been seeing as a result of the war in Ukraine and the end of the pandemic. And the third thing is to deal with the budget mess that we inherited from you lot and to show spending restraint in some of the decisions that we take in the May budget. So it's incorrect to say the government doesn't have a plan. We do have a plan. We are implementing the plan and uh, we look forward to more of that in the budget. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Marielle Smith. No, I beg your pardon, Senator Sheldon. I need my glasses on. Good, thank you. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Thanks. Senator Wong. The situation in Turkey and, uh, Turkey and also in Syria continues to deteriorate. What else would the government do to assist those in affected areas? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, Minister Wong. Thank you, uh, Senator Sheldon, for the question. Uh, and I know I speak for all in this chamber that we have been watching the heartbreaking scenes from Turkey and Syria with horror. Uh, yesterday, as I indicated to the Chamber, the Prime Minister announced an initial commitment of $10 million in humanitarian aid to support the people affected. I'm also pleased to announce uh, that earlier today, following advice from my department, I agreed to activate an Oz Assist plan to deploy an urban search and rescue team of up to 72 personnel to Turkey Air to assist local authorities. Our National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, is now conducting an urgent assessment to ensure the safety of Australian personnel. NEMA is working closely with Fire and Rescue New South Wales, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the ADF to coordinate the deployment as soon as possible. These are urban search and rescue specialists, highly trained to locate, deliver medical assistance to and remove victims who have been trapped or impacted by a structural collapse. Uh, these are uh, extremely difficult times. I think all of us uh, have been horrified uh, by the scenes of devastation and the stories of uh, human tragedy uh, that we are witnessing. Uh, there, are also, uh, there is also so much heroism uh, and um, compassion for one's fellow uh, man and woman and child uh, that is on display uh, in these areas which already have been um, you know, so devastated in many cases. So, uh, if we are able to assist, notwithstanding we are a long way away, I'm sure all of us uh, would want the government uh, to support our personnel to, to engage in such assistance. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Can the minister update the Senate on assistance being provided to Australians and their loved ones impacted by the unfolding emergency? Minister Wong. Uh, I know uh, that this is uh, distressing not, uh, not, not only to all Australians, uh, but particularly to members of the Turkish Australian uh, and Syrian communities, particularly those with loved ones in the areas. And I thought Senator Birmingham's contribution yesterday, where he uh, spoke about their experience, uh, was uh, very moving. Uh, Australian diplomatic missions in Ankara, Beirut and Istanbul are working closely with local authorities to ascertain the welfare of our citizens. Uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is providing consular assistance, uh, including to the families of four Australians who were in the region at the time of the earthquake and I regret to say at this stage remain unaccounted for. Obviously, their safety is our immediate priority, and consular officials in Ankara are working with local authorities and others on the ground to assist them. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is working to provide consular assistance to around 40 other Australians and their families who are in the earthquake Thank you, area. Mr. Wong, the time for the answer in this question has expired. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Can the minister provide an update to the Senate on how Australia's initial contribution is assisting those on the ground? Minister Wong. Uh, yesterday, the Prime Minister announced, as I said, the initial uh, $10 million contribution in humanitarian aid. Today, I can provide a, 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 some update to senators about how these resources are being used and intended to be used. UNICEF has commenced assessment of water infrastructure and health infrastructure da damage. They have dispatched more than 1,000 pre-positioned water, sanitation and hygiene kits 
and is prepositioning and are prepositioning another 10,000 kids. UNICEF is also leading the education response for displaced families seeking shelter in schools. Local Red Cross and Red Crescent teams have been assisting with search and rescue, transportation to hospitals and first aid and distribution of essential non-food items. Uh, we will continue to work with partners to do all that is possible to assist those affected by this tragedy. Thank you, Minister. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. The Prime Minister in October 2019 supposedly led the charge to kick John Setka out of the Australian Labor Party, where he said, quote, John Setka isn't welcome to stay as a member, and I'm pleased he is gone, end quote. And his values aren't the same as Labor's values, end quote. Given that Mr Setka's CFMMEU division gave the Australian Labor Party over $1 million in the last financial year, can you confirm that Mr Setka's supposed expulsion from the party was nothing but a fancy charade, considering you still accept his tainted money? Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Wong. Wow. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, the old broken record. Yes, we, 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 are, we, we can always assume uh, that those opposite will fight about climate change uh, and will uh, unite around uh, trade unions uh, against trade unions. Uh, Order. Uh, I, it's one of, one, of, one of the few things you actually agree on. Order. Uh, we, we have made clear, uh, the Prime Minister has made clear, as leader of the party, uh, his views about Mr Setka's personal membership, personal membership of the, C of the Australian Labor Party. Uh, there are many people who might point to the failure uh, of, of those opposite at times to deal with some people in their ranks, but the Prime Minister, as leader of the party in opposition, uh, was clear about his view of the, the Mr Secker's membership of the Australian Labor Party, and that matter was dealt with by the party organisation. Uh, the matter of donations is a matter, as you know, for the party organisation. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Scar, first supplementary. Thank you, President. I'm not sure what the High Court has said about climate change, but I know what they've said about the CFMEU. They've actually called it a recidivist offender and that the CFMEU considers law-breaking to be a cost of doing business. Can you confirm that the Prime Minister is willing to ignore the behaviour of Mr Secker and the CFMEU because they're $4.3 million in donations to the Labor Party? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Wong. Uh, that, that allegation is untrue and the senator knows it. Uh, we have been clear. Uh, about our view that law breaking, that criminal conduct in any context is unacceptable. Thank you, Senator uh, Wong. Uh, second supplementary, Senator Carr, Scar. Thank you, President. Um, in distinction, in contradistinction, the Prime Minister, Premier Malinowskis, intervened to ensure South Australia Labor returned a donation of $125,000 from the Victorian CFMEU, when will the Prime Minister Albanese show the same leadership as Premier Malinowskis and return federal Labor's multi-million dollar donations from the CFMMEU? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Wong. Uh, as I've uh, indicated in my previous answer, the Prime Minister has made clear his views about Mr Setka. He has made here clear his, his views and the Australian Labor Party's views about compliance with the law and matters of donations are the responsibility of the party organisation. Thank you, Minister Wong. Senator Steele, John. Thank you, President. Next month, my question is to the uh, Foreign Minister. Uh, next month marks 20 years since the Howard government's uh, participation in the catastrophic invasion of Iraq, a war that has killed hundreds of thousands, displaced millions, and left millions more uh, with a trauma that will last generations. Is it the government's view that the 2003 US-led invasion of Iraq was illegal under international law and convention? Thank you, Senator Steele John, Minister Wong. Uh, as the Senator would know, uh, uh, 
the Australian Labor Party at the time uh, placed its views on the public record on these issues. I don't intend to add to them, uh, and nor do I uh, believe at this stage in 2023, 2023 that this is the most important foreign policy priority that the government faces. The more important foreign policy priority that this government faces, that this parliament faces, is the fact that we live in the most difficult strategic circumstances since World War II. And we have to make decisions as a people, as a government, as a parliament about how we deal with that. The government has been clear we will deal with that by utilising all levers of Australian power, both invest through investing in strategic capability but also investing in our diplomatic capability, investing in our diplomacy, in our relationships, because this is part of how we try and keep Australians safe, how we work to keep Australians safe at a time, at a time, at a time where we face these difficulties in our region. Uh, and I've spoken at length about this. Now, it may be that you wish to engage in uh, an historic accounting. That's a matter for you, Senator Steele John. My focus is very much on what we have to do now and into the future. Thank you, Minister. Senator Steele John, first supplementary. Thank you. Minister, of all the responses I prepared for, an effective no comment was not one of them. Let me try one more time. The United Nations has declared the invasion illegal. The advice given to your party was that the invasion was illegal. The broad legal consensus is that the US invasion was illegal. Is it the current view of the Australian government that the US invasion of Iraq was illegal under international law and convention? Uh, that's time. Thanks, Senator Steele. John Minister Wong. Uh, uh, look, I, 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 will, I don't propose to add to the response I gave to the primary? Well, no, because it is, it is uh, the same question. Uh, if, I'm sure through estimates you can speak to the international lawyers in the room if you wish to do so, uh, because this ultimately uh, is a question that might be determined by an international tribunal or court. But uh, as foreign minister at this time, you know, given the, the responsibility and privilege of the job I have, I'm really clear about what my priorities are, and I've outlined them in the earlier answer. Thank you. Order. I, uh, Senator Steele John, before I invite you to ask your second supplementary, I remind you that to ask the question and refrain from commentary. So please ask your second supplementary. Thank you. Twenty years on, will the Labor government, in the name of all who have died and all who continue to suffer, commit to releasing all relevant documentation surrounding the advice to the Howard government about the invasion of Iraq so that Australians can judge for themselves the actions that were committed in their name and whether those actions were illegal, given that we went to war without a single politician being asked to cast a vote? Thank you, Senator Steele. John, Minister. First, in, in relation to the first part of the answer, I'll take on notice uh, what documents can or can't be released. <laughs> Uh, and I'm sure we can have a conversation about uh, this further at estimates. As I said, obviously we, you know, the Australian Labor Party has made its previous views on these matters clear. But I would also point to your last comment. Uh, I think your last comment suggests that, as per the Greens policy, that there should be a parliamentary vote before the executive can commit the ADF to any uh, conflict or, or to any other part of the world. Uh, I've made it clear uh, in discussions in estimates that that's not a view uh, that I share. It's not a view that the government shares. You know, we, we do believe in, the, the, in ministerial accountability. We do believe the parliament uh, should be entitled uh, to appropriate uh, to scrutinise the decision of the executive. The executive should account to the, to the parliament for such a decision. But it is, in, in our view, important for the security of the country that that remains a power and prerogative of the executive. Thank you, Minister Wong. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Albanese government is strengthening Medicare? Minister. Thank you. Thank you, President. And uh, I can. And I thank Senator Smith for the question. Last week, the Prime Minister chaired the National Cabinet meeting, which included consideration of the report from the Strengthening Medicare Task Force. Senators will recall that Labor went to the election with a commitment to improve primary care through $750 million commitment to strengthen Medicare and the establishment of the Strengthening Medicare Task Force and 
to take the interjection to establish urgent care centres across Australia, which we are also doing and working with the states and territories to improve access to after-hours emergency care. I should point out, Ms. Uh, President, that we were the only party to commit additional investment in Medicare at the 2022 election. Probably not surprising in the sense that the former government had, had done everything they could to undermine Medicare over the years, um, cutting it, uh, 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 putting uh, the indexation rates and, and, and um, capping the indexation rates so that it, it affected general practice. Labor is the only party of Medicare. Uh, we know this mob over there wanted to end it. We know you want to undermine it. It's the backbone of our health care system. It's the foundation that has provided the care that Australians need, deserve and expect. And the Australian people expect their government to look at ways to invest in Medicare, not to weaken it, not to cut it, but to look at ways to make it work better for them and put downward costs on, their, um, on the expenses of accessing health care. We know we've got a big challenge ahead. We've got an ageing population, more chronic disease, complex care needs, and the Australian community needs and expects Medicare to be there to meet their needs. We can't do this alone. We will work in partnership with the states and territories to make sure the health system meets the needs of the future. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. As order, order. Interjections across the chamber are disorderly. Order, Senator Wong. Order, Senator Rustin. Um, Senator Marielle Smith, uh, first supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister outline why Medicare needs strengthening? Minister. Yes, I can. I thank um, Senator Smith for the question. Primary health care is in crisis. The shadow minister herself has said that our health system is in crisis at a number of levels, and she even went on to say perhaps we should have been more challenging in Senator reform. Senator Henderson. Oh, what does that mean? That was, oh, that was Senator Rustin, shadow oh, minister for health. Rustin. We should have been more challenging in reform. Mm, what does that mean? Co-payments? It might be. Cuts? It could be. They were the reforms that the government, when you were in power, sought to put in place. The crisis in primary health care is a product of a deliberate decisions made by the former government. Uh, there is no person in Australia who bears more responsibility for this than the now leader of the opposition, right. a man voted by Australia's doctors as the worst, worst health, health minister, minister in a generation. It's a hard award to get, but he won it. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Mariel Smith, second supplementary. Order on my left. Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, President. Can the minister outline the major challenges to strengthening Medicare? Uh, minister. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Smith. I can. There are challenging challenges, including the considerable workforce challenges that we inherited and that we are dealing with. And one of the biggest challenges we're dealing now is the legacy of terminating measures, ah. unfunded measures in the health and aged care portfolio left to us by the co coalition. We see what must have happened when the health and aged care Order. ministers went to ERC. Order. They must have gone to ERC and said, we need some extra money for these things. And the ERC must have said to them, well, you can have it for one year yeah. or maybe two years, and then it's going to end. And that's what we're dealing with now, hundreds of measures that terminate, that just end. 30th of June, no more money. Sorry, adult, adult dental program. We know that adults still have teeth and might still need <laughs> dentist services after the 30th of June, uh, but we're not going to fund it. It's a terminating measure. Well, we're dealing with that. We're cleaning up your mess. Thank you, our Minister Gallagher. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. My question is the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. The Prime Minister has stated that an Indigenous voice to Parliament will consult Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on matters that affect them. If that's the case, will you please provide the Australian people and me with the government's list of all the matters which don't affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, given I'm asked about uh, the voice, I would like to acknowledge, if I may, the 10 leaders from empowered communities who are in the President's gallery today. 
uh, as part of their visit to Canberra to advocate uh, for, from the grassroots for constitutional recognition through the voice to parliament. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, Senator Hanson, I, I, I appreciate your position on the voice, and I think you've made that clear. And probably no answer I, I will give you will satisfy you, because I think you have made your opposition to this clear. Uh, I would make this point. Uh, I would first make the point: the voice is about two things. It is about recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in our constitution, and it is about consultation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on matters that affect them. Uh, in terms of the, the various aspects of detail, um, can we, I, I would make two points. First, the referendum working group have already offered principles of what the voice would look like. The second point I make is if Australians see fit to change our constitution the way I hope they do, you, alongside with every other member and senator in this parliament, will have a say in how that voice operates because it is parliament that will legislate. There will be consultation and there will be legislation, just as you have a right at the moment to, be, uh, to, to uh, respond to and deal with legislation that comes before the chamber. And I Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Hanson, first supplementary. No. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yep, you're right. Are you on a point of order? Matter of re relevance, it's passed half the time of the, of the ministry to respond to my question. It was directly matter. Uh, I asked directly um, about what matters that will um, that, that do not, don't affect the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people. Hasn't even touched uh, on that thank whatsoever. You, Senator it's a matter Senator, of relevance. You've please. raised a point of order. Please resume your seat. You also asked at the beginning of your question about. Uh, a broad question about the voice. You referred to comments the Prime Minister had made, so the, the Minister Wong is being relevant. Please continue. Uh, well, Senator Hanson, I'm not, not, not Senator Hanson. I am trying to respond very honestly because the reality is those no because those, those matters those matters will be the subject of a discussion in this parliament and a discussion with the community should Australians vote for a constitutional recognition. What people what people. Order, Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson, order. You've asked your question. Senator Hanson, I've called you to order. It's an order, not a request. The minister is answering your question. You may not like the answer, but she's answering your question. Please continue, Minister Wong. Senator Hanson, through you, uh, President. What Australians are being asked to vote for on is a principle of whether there should be a voice. The detail will come from the parliament and the government that is elected by the people, and it is for the parliament and future parliaments to determine the detail of how it works, including the issues that you describe. Thank you, Minister Wong. Uh, Senator Hanson, first supplement. Last month, the Minister for Indigenous Australians said that if the provo proposed voice to parliament had been established earlier, then we would not be where we are with escalating violence and crime in Alice Springs. Will the minister please provide the direct evidence supporting this claim, and does the Prime Minister support this claim? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, well, um, Senator Hanson, I think that everybody in this place, I would hope, um, uh, understands that the challenges that we are, uh, see and some of our um, our colleagues are living in Alice Springs and in the Northern Territory are not new challenges. And to pretend otherwise is disingenuous. And I would hope that the principle that if you work with local communities and listen to local communities, you achieve better outcomes. And you know, Ms. Senator Hanson, we, 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 we are very different, come from very different political uh, places, but I do uh, recognise that you do work in your community. You do engage with your community. Uh, and I would think you would understand that policy is intrinsically better if there is an engagement with and listening to the community. The voice is about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people having a say. That's what it's about. And I think we are stronger when people have a say. Yeah. Thank you, Minister Wong. As Senator Hanson, second supplementary. Well, I hope you can answer the third one because I have no, had no response to the second uh, or the first one for that matter. If the referendum rejects the voice being inserted in the constitution, will the government legislate a voice that will clearly be against the will of the people? Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, we are working to uh, in, uh, achieve 
a change to our constitution in accordance with the wishes of so many of our First Nations people who very eloquently articulated this offer of recognition, consultation and a, a path forward together uh, in the Uluru Statement. And we are hopeful uh, that there will be enough people of goodwill in this place and in the community to ensure that we are able to do that, to do what was sought uh, and insert a provision into our constitution. That is what we are doing. So, um, uh, Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Hanson. Relevance to the question. I ask a question. Uh, Senator if Hanson. If the Senate referendum does not Senator get up, Hanson. will they legislate? Senator yes or Hanson. No? Very simple. I've called you to order. You stand up and you ask a point of order. Uh, you talked about the outcome of the referendum, and that is exactly what the minister is referring to. Please continue, minister. Um, we, we are optimistic and we are hopeful about the referendum, and that is the focus of the government's work. And I don't propose to get into a what if, Senator Hanson, because our job as the government is to do what we said we would do if we were elected. Uh, and our job is to keep faith with the commitment we gave not only uh, the Australian people in the broad, but our First Nations Australians, and we will do so. Thank you, Minister. Senator Little. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Gallagher. Senator, how many Australians have died from COVID in residential aged care since 2022 election? Uh, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. I'm not sure I have um, figures since the election. No, I can give you the figures. Order. Uh, she's not the minister. Order. He was the minister. No. He was the minister. Okay. He was the minister. Uh, minister. Minister Gallagher. Minister Gallagher. If you no, I've got the answer. The minister Gallagher. Okay. You asked in 2022. Minister Gallagher, asked I've asked you to resume your seat. The minister was part way through a sentence and then the chamber on my left particularly became so disorderly I could not hear her response. I would ask you to listen in respectful silence. Minister, please continue. Thank you. As I was saying, uh, as I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted, as the second of February there have been five thousand and sixty seven deaths nationally, six hundred and eighty six in twenty twenty, two hundred and twenty six in twenty twenty one. 3,855 in 2022 and 300 in 2023. Now, given the seriousness of the issue that we are talking about, which is the passing of older Australians in aged care facilities, I think your behaviour just then was disgusting. I think it was disgusting. You ask a, you ask a question like that and you behave like that. Absolutely Order. disgusting. Order. I have the information. The difference between me and what happened to Senator Colbeck is that I actually had the information. Order. I'm aware of the numbers. I'm aware of what's happening in aged care. So have a laugh over there. Have a laugh. Um, By all means. By Minister all means. Gallagher. And Minister disrespect Gallagher. the thousands of people Minister in Gallagher. aged care. I have a Order. Order. Senator Cash, I have a senator on her feet. Senator Urquhart. Of order, I would ask Senator McGrath to withdraw that statement, what he called Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, senator McGrath, I did not hear uh, the, um, the, the comments that were made by you or any other senator, but I would ask you to reflect and, you, and in the interests of the good spirit of the chamber, ask you to withdraw with Everything that I called uh, Senator uh, Gallagher. Senator, thank you. Senator McGrath, when, please resume your seat, Senator. When, when I, uh, Senator McGrath, when I ask senators to withdraw, I ask them to do it respectfully. Senator McGrath, you did not do it respect. I would ask you to do it respectfully. Uh, the point of order taken by um, Senator Urquhart asked me to uh, withdraw a comment. You said you didn't know which comment. Um, you asked me to respectfully withdraw a comment. I said many things. I withdrew uh, all Senator of them, McGrath, and I withdraw all of them. Senator McGrath, to assist the smooth running of the Senator McGrath, you did not withdraw respectfully. I withdraw respectfully. Thank you. 
Senator Little, were you on a point of order? Yep. Order. 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 Senators Wong and McGrath. Again, I have Senator Little on her feet. Order. I'm still waiting. Senator Little, first supplementary. Order is, uh, point of order is relevant. Oh, okay. um, the question was specific uh, to. I understand Senator uh, Wong, uh, Senator Gallagher has finished her response. I'll, so that was an I'll move you now to your first supplementary. Okay. Okay. Why did your government change the way aged care deaths are reported on the exact same day that we saw? more aged care residents had died from COVID in eight months under your watch than in two and a half years under the coalition. Mm. What are you trying to hide? Thank you, Senator Little. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. And can I again just say that any death in relation to COVID-19, and indeed in residential aged care, is a tragedy. Um, and um, I think the behaviour of those opposite on the previous question reflects on them, reflects on them, and, and speaks McGrath. to themselves. Data on, data on the number of deaths in residential aged care are reported directly from aged care providers to the department. This is not an official data set and is used for aged care surveillance purposes. It is not directly comparable with published figures on the total number of COVID-19 um, deaths Minister, in Australia. Seat. Senator Rustin. Uh, on a point of order, um, I think the question was very specific around why you changed the means of reporting, not actually asking for a reiteration of how that is reported. I, I think the minister is being relevant. It, but I shall listen carefully. Minister, please continue. Well, I, I re if, if, you, if you want me to, I reject the assertion and the implication of the way the question is put. So that's my answer to the question. I am explaining, I am explaining about uh, how aged care deaths in Australia are reported. If you're not interested in that, that's not my problem. You ask the question, I'm trying to answer it. The review and adjustment to COVID death reporting, including the timing to release uh, the updated data, was a decision of the department. The, uh, the Minister, Minister for Health was briefed time in advance of the release of the data. Senator Little, second supplementary. In February 2022, the now Prime Minister said that deaths in aged care was a measure of performance. We know that more aged care residents have now died from COVID in eight months under the Albanese Labor government than in the entire first two and a half years of the pandemic. Given this tragic statistic, will the Prime Minister now admit that he has completely failed the important measure of performance and step up to the job of protecting older Australians? Thank Come you, on. Senator Little. Minister Gallagher. Well, we are doing everything we can uh, to ensure, and the mortality data, and I will correct the record if I have to, but the mortality data that I'd seen uh, is decreasing compared to the first waves when, when residents in aged care were completely unprotected because of the way you rolled out the vaccine rollout. When you rolled out the vaccine rollout and you didn't meet your own targets, you set yourself the targets. Order. What we saw Order. was people in residential aged care that were completely Order. unprotected. Uh, Senator Wong. I can barely hear Senator Gallagher and she's here. Well, I have asked all members in this place to refrain from commenting and arguing across the chamber, from calling out repeatedly, and I would ask once again that you listen respectfully, Minister. Uh, thank you. The difference uh, between the approach now and the numbers of people uh, with the different waves was that back in 2020, people were left completely unprotected, completely unprotected because of the bungle in the rollout. What we have now with Omicron uh, is uh, that the vast majority, in fact, very high numbers of people in residential aged care are protected through the vaccination program. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Rice. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Minister Watt. Minister, the Samuels Review found that our logging laws, the Regional Forest Agreements or RFAs, had weaker protections than EPBC legislation and inadequate Commonwealth oversight. <laughs> Minister Plibersek's nature-positive plan 
commits to increasing environmental protections for areas under RFAs. Given the need for urgent action to protect our forests, why is native forest logging still occurring under the regional forest agreements? Uh, Senator Rice, thank you. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Rice, for the question. And I recognise this is an issue that uh, you have a long history of activis activism in. Uh, the, obviously, there are two states in Australia which have now decided to phase out native forestry, being Victoria and Western Australia. Uh, but there are a number of states uh, that have not that made that decision. And as you point out, uh, native forestry around a number of states is regulated through regional forestry agreements. Um, the reality is that, uh, at this point in time at least, we are not in a position as a country to, to meet all of our timber needs through plantation forestry. Uh, plantations. It's estimated that plantations supply somewhere like 85 to 90 per cent of timber uh, and paper and products uh, in Australia, and it is completely unrealistic to think uh, that if we were to ban native forestry uh, immediately in the form that you're suggesting, that we would be able to meet our timber, paper, and other wood product needs. Um, quite Senator apart from, Henderson. quite apart from. Uh, the impact Senator that Henderson. such a decision would have on regional communities and the jobs that are delivered uh, through those industries. So it's a little like when I hear these sorts of comments from the Greens, it's a little like uh, the claim and the argument that we should be shutting down all coal and gas tomorrow as well, ignoring the fact that that would bring the electricity network to a halt, um, that that would mean that people's lights would go out. Uh, similarly, if we were to end native forestry today in the way that you suggest, we would not be able to meet our timber and paper and other wood product needs. Uh, unfortunately for the Greens, some of us choose to live in the real world, uh, where we actually need to be making decisions about what will actually happen in the world. And, and we, we, as a government, of course support responsible, sustainable forestry. Uh, Minister Plibersek has flagged an intention uh, to, to look at how this uh, practice is conducted in consultation with stakeholders, but we need to be real. Uh, thank you, Senator Watt. Just before I come to you, Senator Rice, if you wouldn't mind just resuming your seat. Senator Henderson, when I call you to order, that's what I expect. Senator Rice, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Minister, at, at COP15, the Australian government committed to take urgent action for zero extinctions after 2030. There are hundreds of rare, threatened and endangered animals and plants that live in and as part of our forests, including the critically endangered wallet or Leadbeater's possum and the greater glider. Minister, in this real world, the RFA are, al uh, A's are allowing these species to continue their trajectory towards extinction. Will you scrap the RFAs and end Thank native you, forest Senator logging Rice, as part of your expired. government commitment? Minister Watt. Yeah. The, thank you, uh, Senator Rice. Um, I've already outlined the reasons why it would not be a prudent move to do the kind of things that you're talking about, whether we're talking about supplies, whether we're talking about regional economies and jobs. Uh, but it is the case that we do want to make sure that Australia's forestry industry is as sustainable as possible. Uh, and that's why Minister Plibersek, in responding to the Samuels review uh, last year, said, and I'll quote, Regional forestry agreements are designed to have regard to environmental values such as old growth forests and wilderness endangered species and world heritage matters, uh, but they are currently exempt from the EPBC Act, which makes them unique. As part of our government's reforms, we will begin a process of applying a, our new national environmental standards to regional forestry agreements. We will consult, consult with stakeholders on how this will be done. Uh, we want to make sure uh, that the management of our forestries in this country is done as sustainably as possible, but we do need to meet some of the current timber uh, and paper product needs that our country has. But we flagged uh, an intention to consult with stakeholders as we apply Thank those Minister EPBC Watt, principles. The time for answering has expired. Senator Rice, second supplementary. Minister, scientific analysis shows that ending native forest logging would have very significant benefits to the climate and would be the easiest and most significant land use change that could be implemented to help Australia meet its carbon reduction targets. Minister, given your government's commitment to tackling the climate crisis, won't you scrap the RFAs and end native forest logging? Yeah. Thank you, Senator. Senator Rice, Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. Well, um, as I say, Senator Rice, um, I invite you to let 
the Australian people know how we would meet uh, our timber Order. and paper product needs if we were to end native forestry Senators immediately Wilson in the way that you McKenzie. suggest. Uh, I also invite you uh, to explain to the Australian people um, what, uh, what effect on the environment it would have if, as a result of ending native forestry overnight, uh, instead Australian importers were to turn to uh, forestry uh, activities overseas, uh, which have far worse environmental standards than our own country does. What we're trying to do is make sure that we have Order. a sustainable forestry Order. industry, that we can meet our timber and paper product needs, but that we have strong environmental principles around it. And that's exactly what Minister Plibersek has flagged as part of the implementation of the Samuels Review. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. My question is to uh, the Minister for Trade and Tourism, uh, my good friend, Senator Farrell. International students make an important contribution to the economy and diversity of communities across Australia. How is the international education sector faring in the aftermath of the pandemic, and, and what are the long-term effects of the former government's complete lack of support and the former Prime Minister telling students to go home? Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator, uh, Senator Farrell. I'll take that uh, interjection. Uh, <coughs> I'll, I'll, take, I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> but they're all, they're all good. They're all good. <coughs> um, thank uh, Senator O'Neill for that uh, question. And I know she has a great interest in uh, education, particularly the topic of her question, which was international education. And regrettably, uh, President, um, international education was one of the hardest hit sectors uh, of our economy during the uh, pandemic. With students unable to travel to Australia, the former government's bungling uh, meant that many education institutions were not able to access financial support. Worst of all was the damage done by the former Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison, <coughs> which damaged our international reputation by telling international students to go home. Scott Morrison, <coughs> yep, that's what he said. That's what he said. That's what he said, Senator Watt. <coughs> Scott Morrison made it clear that um, his government— Senator Farrell, I just remind you to refer to um, people in the other place by their correct titles. I'm, I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Madam uh, President. Uh, former Prime Minister Scott Morrison made it very clear that his government didn't care about international students, didn't care about educational institutions, and most importantly, he didn't care about those who relied on them to support their families. Uh, the message to parents of international students was that the Morrison government didn't care about their children and didn't want them here. In one single press conference, uh, the former Prime Minister uh, caused a massive setback of, uh, 40 uh, to a, to a $40.3 billion industry. Uh, thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Thank you. With international travel normalising and international students being able to resume their education on campuses here in Australia, what is the current state of play for the international education sector? Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Farrell. Thank, uh, Senator, thank you, President, and I thank uh, Senator O'Neill for her uh, question. Well, of course, we hope that international travel is, uh, is normalising, but with no thanks uh, to the previous government, the sector remains uh, one of the largest export industries. Its recovery is testament to the quality education our institutions offer and the hard work uh, of industry and government agencies. In December, there were uh, <coughs> over 452,200 student visa holders in Australia. Not pre-COVID levels yet, but the industry uh, pleasingly, is, uh, is recovering. The uh, Albanese Labor government is proud to be welcoming back international students from across the world. While China is still our largest and most valuable market, diversification is occurring and growth in other markets, including India, Nepal, Colombia and Vietnam. Last year, Austrade supported the India Comprehensive Strategic thank Partnership. Thank you, uh, Senator Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President and Senator Farrell. 
Looking to the future, what is the Australian government doing to support the international education sector to assist the recovery you were describing? Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Minister. Thank you, President, um, and thank you, Senator um, O'Neill. Well, <clears throat> a lot more than the previous government is the uh, answer yeah, to that. The answer. the answer to that. Uh, to that answer, <laughs> the answer to that question. My agency, Austrade, which is responsible for promoting Australia's international yeah. education offerings globally, has been working hard to support the uh, sector's uh, recovery. Dedicated staff in six, uh, th um, 36 locations provide advice, support and uh, connections to registered uh, Australian international education clients. Austrade's International Education Centre of Excellence oversees the uh, sector strategy and manages uh, um, the Study Australia website. Recent upgrade to the uh, Study Australia website have new users um, uh, increased by 24.7 per cent in 2022, with over 7.5 million unique page views, up 28 per cent on the year. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. At the last election, Labor promised a building capacity, building community policy aimed at increasing capacity in the Australian charity sector. And in the October budget, the Albanese government committed to a Productivity Commission review of the framework that incentivises philanthropic giving to charities. Can the minister confirm that as of today, no further announcements have been made on either Labor Party promises? Thank you, Senator Dean Smith. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. I never know what questions are going to come from you. Um, and I think I, um, in respect to the chamber, I will have to take that on notice. Um, hang on, I'll see whether I can find something on my feet. Um, I'm not sure that's the same question that I got asked. Um, <laughs> I think it's probably in the interest of getting you an accurate answer, Senator Smith. I think um, it wasn't in my top list of issues to prepare for in question time today, but I will uh, come back to the chamber with any information I can. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dean Smith, first supplementary. I agree you should trust me first. <laughs> does, the minister, does the minister agree that the charity sector, facing unprecedented, unprecedented demand due to the cost of living crisis and Labor's insufficient plan to address it, deserves a government that prioritises charities' urgent needs and delivers on its promises. Thank you. Senator Smith, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I thank Senator Smith for the question. And I would say that in the budget, one of the largest line items that we had was to increase indexation uh, to community organisations, some of whom are charities, uh, who provide services to the community in response to the fact that they had been inappropriately or the indexation that had applied was not adequate and not allowed them to continue to um, meet some of the costs they were incurring. Um, that was in the order of several hundreds of millions of dollars, and it was in re re response to a request from ACOS and some in the charity sector to have a look at the indexation when we came into government. I undertook to do that. It was unfair. It had been left in an inadequate state, hadn't been addressed, and it was, you know, in a finance sense, quite costly uh, to, to deal with. Uh, but we did that in the first budget uh, in respect of the work that they do, the value that we place in it and the fact that we recognise their costs were increasing and they needed extra Thank support. You, Minister. Uh, Senator Smith's second supplementary. The index ma indexation matter is a good one, but it's not the subject of this question. How does the, how does the minister explain the government dragging its feet on delivering its modest commitments to Australian charities at a time when they are needed the most? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Smith for the question. Um, and I, I don't accept uh, the proposition that he puts. Uh, I know that um, my colleague, um, the member for Fenner, 
who has responsibility for this area, has been working uh, closely and um, is focused on this area. I just don't have an update of where that, all of that work is, but I have undertaken to come back to the chamber and, and provide that information and that update. And perhaps it's something that we can explore in estimates, uh, Senator Smith. Um, now that I'm aware that of your interest in it, I will make sure that officials and myself um, are briefed fully so that we can take you through all the work that has been being done. But I know that um, the focus of the, um, of the assistant, assistant treasurer has been um, to focus in this area. I have some information on fundraising reform, but I'm not sure it answers your question. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President. And my question is to the Minister for Women, uh, Senator Gallagher, uh, also. Uh, and I'm uh, confident that my question uh, is at the top of your priority list, <laughs> Senator Gallagher. <laughs> and, uh, Order. And, uh, Order. And also at the top of the, also at the top of the priorities of the whole Albanese government, uh, Senator Gallagher, uh, can can you please can you please update the Senate on how the Albanese government is taking action to close the gender pay gap? Thank you, Senator Walsh, Minister Gallagher. Good uh, thank you, President, and um, I thank um, I thank Jess, Senator Walsh. <laughs> Uh, for the question, and I can assure the chamber this is a question that I have prepared for earlier. Um, but it is an important subject, and I'm proud that to be a member of a government that's introducing the workplace gender equality amendment, closing the gender pay gap bill uh, into the parliament later today. This is an important step forward in advancing gender equality in Australian workplaces. Together with the remade instruments under the Act, it fulfils a key election commitment of our government to close the gender pay gap at work, including by boosting pay gap transparency and taking action to help close the gender pay gaps within organisations. On average, women working full time can expect to earn 14.1 per cent less than men per week in their pay packets. Current projections suggest that this will take another 26 years for this gap to close. This is too long, and women shouldn't have to wait, nor should our daughters or those that are being born today, those girls being born today. It's not fair. Uh, we need to address it. With these reforms, we will, for the first time in Australia, publish gender pay gaps of businesses that employ 100 or more people. The reform only covers employers that already report to WGIA, and it will be drawn on existing reporting, so employers themselves will not need to provide any additional information. If they choose to, employers can provide information about their gender pay gap and any action they are taking to close it. And employers will have around a year to get ready with the first reporting planned for early 2024. Gender pay Gender pay gap data will be published on WGIA's website in a searchable tool available to the public. This will add to the rich data already publicly available on WGIA's website. Reporting will commence in 2024, and it draws on all of that data, as I said before, from um, information already collected. The legislation being introduced responds to the recommendations of the review of the Workplace Gender Thank Equality you, Act Your time 2012. Has expired. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Minister, for outlining those uh, historic and uh, very necessary reforms that I'm sure will be supported uh, by all of us uh, here in this place uh, in the chamber. Um, could you go a little further uh, and outline for us uh, why it is that gender equality must be considered a core economic uh, imperative and, and why it is being considered a core imperative by our government? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Uh, Minister. Thank you, and thank you, Senator Walsh, for the supplementary. On average, across all jurisdictions and occupations, Australian women earn $263.90 per week less than men. That is a lot of money to be short each week, and it entrenches women's disadvantage and economic inequality. It's not right that women are missing out just because of our gender. It's not just bad for women, it's bad for our economy as well. The gender pay gap is estimated to cost our economy $51.8 billion a year, lost when it comes to women's pay. The consensus on women's economic equality as a, as a key economic priority was an important and actually the first outcome at last year's Jobs and Skills Summit. 
One of the immediate outcomes from the Jobs and Skills Summit was for the government to require businesses with 100 employees or more to publicly report their gender pay gap data to WGIA, which is implemented through today's legislations. And I should say employers benefit too, because gender equality you, makes Minister. good Your business time sense. For has expired. Uh, Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank you, Minister. And of course, uh, the historic reforms that you're talking about are really just the beginning for our government uh, and our commitment to gender equality as a core of our agenda. Uh, is really just the beginning. Uh, can you outline what other actions the Albanese government is taking to drive economic equality for women? Minister. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Walsh, for too long Australia has fallen behind the rest of the world when it comes to gender equality, and I know many members in this place were at the UN um, Women Australia's um, breakfast this morning, um, and where this subject was talked about. I think from all of the speakers who, who addressed us, including the Prime Minister and our leader here, Senator Wong. Under the previous government, Australia fell to 43rd of 145 countries on the World Economic Forum Global, Global Gender Gap Index 2022, having ranked 15th in 2006. We ranked 50th for economic empowerment, and it fell as low as to 71st in 2021. We want to address this and improve on these results considerably. The Albanese government is working hard to restore Australia as a global leader on gender equality. Our budget put gender equality front and centre, investing over $7 billion to drive gender equality and reintroducing gender-responsive budgeting. Has expired. Minister Wong. Uh, President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Senator Smith. Deputy President, I rise this afternoon to take, uh, note, take, of, take, note? Yes, to take note of answers given to all questions asked by coalition senators. Thank you. You had the call. Just wait for my colleagues to disperse or be quiet. Can my colleagues on my left please be quiet? Senator Smith is on his feet. Thank you. I'm going to do just two things in the brief opportunity I have this afternoon, in all seriousness. The first is to remind the government about their commitment, their policy that was aimed at improving, sustaining, refreshing, energising Australia's charity sector. And then the second thing I'm going to do, and I'm embarrassed to have to do it, but is to highlight the very, very real concerns the evidence that is now appearing that demonstrates that Australia's charity and not-for-profit sector, which has done good work, which many Australians regularly rely upon, is feeling the strain. And it's a feeling the strain of a number of things. It is feeling the strain of the current cost of living pressures, made worse for them because many of them are still feeling the fatigue and the exhaustion of having, run, having responded to a series of natural disasters in our country, stepped up in their local communities during the pandemic, and now are facing very, very real and serious and immediate challenges. I would hope that after today's brief remarks, this issue does get to the top of Senator Gallagher's priorities. I hope it does get to the top of the government's priorities, because you can't be interested in providing cost of living relief if you're not also interested in supporting Australia's charity and not-for-profit sector. Labor committed in its building capacity, building community policy to do just three things. And we heard from Senator Gallagher this afternoon that not one has been delivered. The first is an appointment of an expert reference panel. 
how difficult can that be, how long should that take. The second was to create a blueprint mapping out how Australian charities could reach their potential, how urgent that has now become. Thirdly, they said they would provide coaching to the charity and community sector to fulfil its important and very, very urgent and needy role as frontline responders. And it said in the budget it would do one more thing, and that was to initiate a productivity commission inquiry into philanthropic giving. How difficult can that be? How urgent it has become? It's disappointing that over the last few days, indeed last week, much of the commentary in our newspapers has been about cost of living pressures, has been about the number of fixed mortgage rates shifting across to variable rates. But we hear this afternoon, 800,000 of them, 800,000 fixed rate loans shifting across to variable rates in this year alone. But we heard from the responsible minister that it's not yet reached the list of the government's priorities. So let me just share what the sector is saying. What the sector is saying. December last year, the sector released a report. It said, key findings, you don't have to look very hard, page seven, 3 per cent of participants said their main service could always meet demand. That means 97 per cent of services do not feel like they can meet demand. 63 per cent of survey participants, and this is surveys of charity providers, reported the cost of living pressures affected the people or communities their service supports. This was the most frequent reported challenge. 57 per cent of participants said access to affordable housing or homelessness affected their service users and communities. This was much higher amongst providers focused on domestic and family violence, 94 per cent, and financial, legal and emergency ports, supports, 90 per cent. In the last budget, just in October, the government applauded itself for delivering on its election commitments. Today, second sitting day of the new parliamentary year, and they still not have been able to deliver on what has now become a most critical, a most urgent election commitment and election promise. The matter is serious, and I hope we get some responses soon. Thank you very much, and I'm really pleased to contribute to this debate um, in addressing the answer given by um, uh, Minister Gallagher um, around what is the government's major priority. The number one thing that we are focused on as a government is the economy and responding to the challenges that we are facing right now. And can I say we are acutely aware as a government of the very difficult nature of interest rate rises and the impact that this is having on households and families and small businesses. It is our number one focus and that is why we are delivering cost of living relief for Australian families. I know that uh, those opposite would like to ignore some of these steps and even at times vote against them. But it is clear that we are delivering and responding to a very challenging economic situation in a manner that is um, affordable and responsible, but delivers that relief for families. We have delivered cheaper medicines for Australians and we are delivering cheaper child care. We passed the legislation last year it will come into um, force um, very soon for Australian families. Uh, and to ignore this as an economic measure just shows that those opposite have not learnt how important childcare, how important economic participation from women really is to our economy. And we're delivering energy relief. We came back to parliament. It's, it was a priority and urgency for our government. That is why we ensured that we could pass ex extraordinary times, call for extraordinary measures, and we passed that bill despite the fact that those opposite voted against it. They voted against cost of living relief, cost of living relief for 
families, for small businesses, for no other reason other than they are uh, ideologically opposed to any, any action when it comes to delivering cost of living relief. That can be the only explanation. That can be the only explanation as to why they voted against cost of living relief on energy bills for Australian families. We're getting on with the job of delivering these important measures and we're doing it in a responsible way that seeks to make sure that we don't create any further inflation. We are making sure that we are spending responsibly and we are tackling our supply chain issues. But it's funny to me that those opposites seem to think or want, want to believe that they left this brand new house for um, the new government to walk in, into. No curtains, no furnishing, nothing, untouched. Untouched, that nothing had been happened. This is what we inherited. We inherited a house that had, had an 18-year-old birthday party in for two nights. Everything was broken, the budget was a mess, and we inherited a trillion dollars in debt. A trillion dollars in debt, budget in a complete and utter mess. You want to forget about this, but that is the situation that you've left us in. Funds for the National Party with colour-coded spreadsheets, irresponsible spending, terminating measures of incredibly important programs that just have no funding in the future, and absolutely no energy plan. After 22 tries, they couldn't land a single energy policy, and yet they want to come here and vote against energy price relief. They left us with skill shortages across the country, which are impacting our economy. We know that, but we're getting on with the job of um, dealing with those skill shortages with fee-free TAFE. On top of this mess that we inherited, this absolute mess that we inherited, a trillion dollars in debt that the, those opposite want to completely ignore and completely pretend does not exist, we are delivering responsible and affordable budget measures. And we're doing it in a way that makes sure that every single Australian family knows that our number one priority is dealing with these economic challenges that we're facing, responding to these cost of living pressures and doing it in a way that does not create worse inflation, that does not contribute, contribute to the issues. That is what we're doing. Senator Reynolds. Right. Pretty President. Well, listening to those opposite, you'd think that all is absolutely fabulous. Uh, in, out and about across Australia. Well, let me tell you, as a senator for Western Australia, let me tell you, come out to any supermarket, any, anywhere where Australians are spending money. And in Western Australia, retail sales are down 30 per cent last month because the cost of living is biting and it is biting hard. So I'll challenge any one of you over there to come with myself and Senator O'Sullivan Go out into the suburbs of Perth and out in rural regional Australia and you just trot out that rubbish about how great life is under, under, under you. It demonstrably is complete and utter lies. So if you think, if you think that people aren't feeling the cost of pressure through the inflationary measures that you're doing through increased interest rates, then come and speak to real Australians because let me tell you what they're telling us. They are saying that they are struggling to pay for their groceries. They are having to make incredibly difficult choices each and every day on how they feed their families. They are struggling to pay their power bills because you promised you would reduce them by $275, and instead they have gone up and up and up. And it's not only individuals and their families, it is businesses large and small who are struggling with all of these inflationary pressures that you've put on our economy. They are struggling to pay for their mortgages. And as we have heard, 800,000 Australians and many tens of thousands of Western Australians are about to come off uh, fixed mortgages and fixed interest rates, and they will be struggling even further. And you are doing nothing but put further pressure on uh, in interest rates and inflation. West Australians are not only struggling to build a house or to afford a mortgage, 
They're also struggling. They are struggling to pay their rent with the increased uh, inavailability of uh, houses to rent. They are not taking holidays and they are working significant overtime. In fact, 12 per cent of Western Australians who are renting are looking to downsize uh, their rental property, but of course they can't find any because the McGowan government has been completely derelict in actually providing uh, greater housing stock and rental stocks in Western Australia. You are keeping the Albanese Labor government is demonstrably putting pressure on the cost of living of all Western Australians. And please, please, please take up our offer, won't we, Senator O'Sullivan? We will take you to any shopping centre in Western Australia and you talk to real Australians and you tell them what tripe you've just put out here in this Senate. It is complete and utter rubbish. And of course, for Western Australians who deserve far better from this current government in terms of helping them with their cost of living, they've also subject to the complete dereliction of the McGowan Labor government. So in Western Australia, we have a double whammy. Uh, and again, you, if you're concerned about healthcare, come and talk to West Australians about the tragedies that impact on every family now in Australia. So they're not only struggling for their health care, their cost of living. Our hospitals in Western Australia, despite record funding uh, from us when we were in government, are at breaking point. We have thousands and thousands of sick and injured Western Australians now who sit out for hours and hours and hours outside of the emergency room, not because the state government doesn't have enough money. It's because they cannot manage their doctors, their nurses and make beds available. So, Western Australians deserve so much better. Um, so, for example, the WA state Labor government promise a lot on infrastructure. They have record surpluses, and yet they are not spending the money uh, on health care. They've spent six years delivering supposedly better rail, the Metronet. And guess what? After six years and about three times the budget blowout, there is not a single, single train on any of those tracks yet. And people in outer suburbs who are already feeling the cost of living pressure are still having to pay exorbitant amounts and time to transport themselves to their places of work. Uh, and again, I have to note, in terms of Western Australia and West Australians deserving better, I mean, our Premier there is so out of touch. His comments today on Carnarvon and having been there recently for his fly in, fly out actually 18 months ago. Uh, fly in, fly out to do a pub pub publicity stunt, and he hasn't been up there since to have a look at the devastation uh, that alcohol and also you know, many of the other issues, social issues that are plaguing Carnarvon. So Western Australians deserve better from both Senator Smith. states. Senator Reynolds, please be seated. Um, thanks, Deputy President. It's, um, Anyone listening to this at home would be wondering when the last chance uh, those opposite had in government. It wasn't that long ago. You spent the better part of the last decade in government. Low ambition government. Short memories. <laughs> Short memories. Because none of this stuff started on the 19th of May in 2022. The, the issues you're referring to, the issues around cost of living, started well before that. The inflationary pressures started well before that. Many of the challenges in our economy started well beyond, before that, and they started under your watch. So short memories, for sure. Also, not good listening skills, because I just sat here through Senator Green's contribution, where she um, uh, very delicately acknowledged the, the great difficulties facing Australians at the moment when it comes to cost of living. Great difficulties. These issues are biting. They're really stinging. I know they're stinging in South Australia. They're singing in terms of the cost of rents, which are soaring in many parts of Adelaide and around our state. Supply issues in the housing market are causing these challenges, something we're seeking to address through our housing policies in government, something which has been neglected for the better part of a decade. And yes, interest rates are creating significant challenges for Australians with mortgages. These pressures are real. They're real and they're hurting people in my state. And that's why our government is acting. But let's not pretend you can act in this way without some degree of delicacy, right? You need to be careful. You need to be responsible. You need to show restraint in the budget. And that's exactly what our Treasurer and our government has done. 
We have been working to deliver cost of living relief for Australians in a way which won't add further pressure to inflation through things like our policies to lower the cost of medicines, a significant reform which makes a real difference to many, many Australians and some of our most vulnerable Australians who are reliant on regular medicines. This will make a very significant difference. And for people of my generation, the costs of childcare are enormous, absolutely enormous. They eat into a huge part of a family's budget each week. They are a necessary expense to participate in the economy, to maintain your connection with the workforce, and of course, to give children access to that amazing, incredible thing which we call play-based learning, which sets them up for a great start in life. But these costs are significant, which is why we've introduced a significant, significant package to lower the cost of childcare and increase access to early learning. And we have responsibly supported wage growth. We supported an increase to the minimum wage, a significant, a significant measure which makes a big difference in the lives of Australians, our lowest paid Australians, with cost of living pressures. But we are doing these things responsibly. We are doing them in the context of restraint. And alongside these measures, we're addressing challenges in the supply side. Challenges like the skills gaps in our economy, skills challenges which that ignored and untouched by the previous government for the better part of the decade. We're doing this through measures like our fee-free TAFE positions. We're investing in cleaner and cheaper energy. After almost a decade of failed energy policy after failed energy policy, that failure to give the market and businesses the investment guidelines they needed to stimulate that part of our economy, to grow jobs in that part of our economy, we've made those decisions. We've legislated those targets to provide that certainty and to provide that growth. Of course, we didn't come to government to a perfect economy. We came to a, a government which uh, we inherited a trillion dollars worth of their debt, a trillion dollars worth of debt with very little economic dividend to show for it. We came to government at a time of falling real wages. We came to government at a time of increasing energy prices where the insecurity and instability in the energy market because of their failure to legislate, because of their failure to choose a policy and stick to it, and we came to government at a time of significant skill shortages. All of these are things that we are working on. We understand that cost of living is biting at the moment. It's biting people in my state. It's biting people in Adelaide. And that's why we are working to address it. And I am sure and have great confidence that our May budget will take even further measures to help support Australians with these cost of living pressures. So let's lose the, the dodgy listening skills and stretch back a bit further in your memory, because we are doing- uh, Senator Little. Thank you. The opposition is committed to supporting the health, safety and wellbeing of older Australians and we hope the Albanese government continues our generational reform of the aged care system for the benefit of all residents. The opposition called on the Labor government to prioritise keeping vulnerable older Australians safe, something they failed to do in 2022, and unfortunately it looks like they have failed again. The minister earlier today couldn't tell us how many Australians have died from COVID in residential aged care since the 2022 election? Couldn't answer that question. This government has neglected older Australians through devastating COVID outbreaks at the end of last year. Shamefully, the minister characterised her response to this situation as a watching brief. How long are you going to watch? Act. This last wave of the COVID-19 virus has seen more aged care residents die of COVID in the first eight months of the Albanese government than in the whole two and a half years dealing with the pandemic. It flies in the face of transparency that in the exact same week that marked this serious milestone, the data reporting changed. The minister said she would put the care back into aged care, but instead she has ripped out the measures put in place to protect older Australians through the pandemic and has now changed the reporting system, which raises further serious questions. Sensible measures like supplying PPE and rats to residential aged care 
are important, but the tragic statistics show that is not enough. The government also ended the most effective vaccine program, Operation COVID Shield. Despite health advice, the vaccination is the most effective defence against new waves of the pandemic. All Australians want and expect our older Australians to be well supported and cared for in our community, including in residential aged care homes. That is why, in government, the coalition called the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety to ensure our oldest and most vulnerable Australians receive care that supports and respects their dignity and recognises the important contribution they have made to society. The final report of the Royal Commission makes 148 recommendations. Following 23 public hearings over 99 days, 641 witnesses and over 10,000 public submissions, they are the product of wise and compassionate scrutiny of Australia's aged care system. In response to the Royal Commission, the Coalition committed $19.1 billion to a five-year plan to improve aged care with new home care packages, respite services, training places, retention bonuses and infrastructure upgrades. upgrades. The opposition remains committed to supporting the health, safety and well-being of older Australians and understands the important role that aged care providers, care workers and nurses play in ensuring this support is provided in residential aged care settings. I acknowledge the work they have done and that they continue to do. During the election campaign, Labor said it would put the care back into aged care, but instead they have delayed the delivery of the Fair Work Commission's 15 per cent pay rise for Australia's hardworking and dedicated aged care staff. This is another shocking, broken promise from the Labor government. After repeatedly committing to fully fund the outcome of the pay rise case, the Labor government has now announced that they will only deliver a 10 per cent rise next year for the sector, with the remaining 5 per cent delayed an entire year. This government has neglected older Australians through devastating COVID outbreaks. At the end of last year, shamefully, the minister characterised her response again as a watching brief. The minister did say she would put the care back into aged care. We look forward to seeing evidence of that and the data that supports that. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you, Deputy President. Next month marks 20 years since the Howard government's decision to participate in the catastrophic US-led invasion of Iraq, a war that killed hundreds of thousands, displaced millions and left uh, millions more with a trauma that they still live with and that will last for generations. Now, during the course of this question time period, I'll put a simple question uh, to the Foreign Minister and to the government. I asked whether it was the government's view that the 2003 invasion of Iraq was illegal under international law and convention. And the response was, we have no further comment. It's 2023. As though to suggest to this chamber that the Iraq war and its implications are not something that the people of Iraq and that the people of Australia continue to live with to this day. Five million orphans were created by the Iraq war Hundreds of thousands lost their lives. Today, the direct result of the war is still the third largest cause of death and the largest contributor to child mortality. The infrastructure, the services, the health care and education of that sovereign nation was devastated by a military campaign in which this Howard government, this Australian government, participated in willingly. Now this month, leading up to the anniversary of the invasion, must be a period of reflection and of hard introspection. What happened? Who is responsible? 
What are the impacts that people are living with today? How do we ensure that it never happens again? Who made the decision to go to war? Who gave the order? How did we end up there? How is it that when 92 per cent of the Australian population opposed an illegal invasion, that their government was able to go ahead and do it anyway? And how is it now that an Australian Labor Party government comes before this chamber? in the context of that reality, with no comment. I yield my time. Senator Shoebridge. Twenty years now since Iraq was illegally invaded, an invasion predicated on lies sold to the world by Western governments that together went to war in Iraq, and that included Australia, and no one has been held to account. The initial shock and awe military campaign killed more than 7,000 Iraqi civilians in just two months. You can just imagine the fear of communities on the ground facing that swift, ferocious invasion. The war and its aftermath since have since claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis. Iraqis are still waiting for justice and accountability for the full truth of what happened, and indeed the entire region is, is struggling with the instability of violence caused by the war. And Australian war veterans who were sent to fight a brutal, bloody, illegal war based on a lie are still waiting for answers. And the current Labor government is refusing to give those answers. Yesterday, Labor teamed up with the Liberals to stop the Greens' push for accountability for the release of documents surrounding the decision to go to war. This is exceptionally frustrating because two decades ago the then Labor opposition joined with the Greens and millions of Australians in opposing that war. The United Nations General Secretary Kofi Annan said in September 2004 that, from our point of view and the UN Charter point of view, the war was illegal. And today, the current Labor Foreign Minister still won't state a position on whether or not the law was illegal. Why not? Why do we still not know who made the decision and on what alleged legal basis to send Australia into that brutal, unjust, illegal war? And worse still, the WikiLeaks founder and Australian citizen Julian, Julian Assange, who has been a vital truth-telling force about the illegal invasion of Iraq, is still sitting in a UK maximum security prison for the crime of telling the truth. It's about time the Australian, the Australian people learnt the truth. It's well past time the Iraqi people learnt the truth about this illegal war. And we say again, with the 20th anniversary coming up, this is the chance for Labor to remember where it stood two decades ago and tell the truth about the illegal war. I put the question. Those of the questions say aye. Against no. The ayes have it.